Suzdal Camp 160, 200 kilometers east of Moscow. This is where the German officers were taken after the capture at Stalingrad. There are very few detailed testimonies of what the stay there was like. A young translator working in the camp provided one. He later became a famous historian. His name was Alexander Blank. But before we review this unique document, let's get back to the Stalingrad region and see how a British war correspondent described his own meeting with the German generals just a few days after the capture. His name was Alexander Werth. He covered the entire Soviet-German war, staying in the USSR for almost all of it. He had the opportunity to meet the newly captured German officers and he wrote a magnificent book, The Year of Stalingrad. On February 3, 1943, we were driven for about an hour through the snow-covered steppes, it was now minus 20 degrees centigrade, to another village. We were never told its name. The reason for such secrecy was obvious, for here we were going to see the German generals. What if German paratroopers suddenly landed here in a desperate attempt to rescue them, which was unlikely? or if they tried to bomb them out of existence now that they were of no further use to the Reich and might even prove a liability. It was a village of rather flimsy wooden cottages with a few trees and with no local inhabitants by the look of it. Everywhere there were soldiers, but no civilians. The generals were living in four cottages, five or six in each. We could not enter their room and had to speak to them with, if they were willing to talk, through the door from the passage. Some were in the background, sitting or standing, with their backs more or less turned to us. It was rather like being in a zoo where some animals showed interest in the public and others sulked. Some of those in the background turned to the door from time to time and glared. The first thing that hit you in the eye were their orders, medals, crosses. Some of them almost like mantelpiece ornaments pinned to their uniforms. Some were wearing monocles, looking like caricatures of Erich von Schlorheim, almost too good to be true. But they varied a lot. Some tried to make the best of it. General von Zedlitz, who was before long to play an important part of the Free Germany Committee, as we'll see later in this video, tried to see the funny side of it all. And so did General de Bois, who grinned and said, as if asking us not to be frightened, that he was an Austrian. And General von Schlömer, who also grinned and said, come on, come on, now what do you want to know? and familiarly patted one of our conducting officers on the shoulder, and, pointing to his new epaulette, said, Was neu? with a comic look of surprised, an enormous approving nod, as much to say, Well, I suppose you are a real army by now. The most unpleasant of them was General von Arnim. He was enormously tall, with a long twisted nose and a look of fury in his long, horse-like face, with popping eyes. He had a stupendous display of crosses and medals. When somebody asked why the Germans had allowed themselves to be trapped at Stalingrad, he snarled, The question is badly put. You should have asked how we held out for so long against such overwhelming numerical superiority. One of the sulking ones in the background then said something about hunger and cold. When somebody suggested that the Russian army was perhaps better than the German army, and certainly better led, von Arnim snorted and went almost purple with rage. I then asked how he was being treated. Again he snorted. The officers, he said, reluctantly, are correct, but the Russian soldiers. Das sind Dieber, das sind Halunken, so eine Schweinerei. He fumed. Impudent thieves, they stole all my things. Eine Schweinerei, vier Koffer, four suitcases, and they stole them all. The soldiers, I mean, he added, as a concession, not the Russian officers. Die Offiziere sind ganz korrekt. These people had looted the whole of Europe. But what was that compared with his four suitcases? When a Chinese correspondent asked about Japan, he said stiffly, with another devastating glare, 
We immensely admire our gallant Japanese allies for their brilliant victories over the English and the Americans. We wish them many more victories. He was then asked what all those crosses and mantelpiece ornaments were, and he rattled them off one after another. The golden frame with the black spider of a swastika was, he said, the Deutsche Kreuz in gold, and the Führer himself had designed it. One would have thought that you'd have a slight grudge against the Führer, somebody suggested. He glared and merely said, the Führer is a great man, and if you have any doubts you will soon have occasion to put them aside. The man was one of the few German generals who was to keep completely aloof during the rest of the war from the Free Germany Committee. One thing was astonishing about these generals. They had been captured only a couple of days before, and yet they looked healthy and not at all undernourished. Clearly throughout the agony of Stalingrad, when their soldiers had nothing to eat, they had continued to have more or less normal meals. There could be no other explanation for their almost normal weight and appearance. The only man who looked in a poor shape was Paulus himself. We weren't allowed to speak to him. He was only shown to us so that we could testify that he was there and had not committed suicide. He stepped out of a large cottage, looking more like a villa, gave us one look, then stared at the horizon, and stood on the steps for a minute or two, in a rather awkward silence, with two other officers, one of whom was General Schmidt, his chief of staff. Paulus looked pale and sick, and had a nervous twitch in his left cheek. He had a more natural dignity than the others, and wore only one or two decorations. The cameras clicked, and a Russian officer politely dismissed him, and he went back into the cottage. The others followed, and the door closed behind him. It was over. And now let's get back to the Moscow region and see what happened with the captured generals, the other officers, and especially Field Marshal Paulus. Built in the St. Euphemius Monastery in 1943, the Sizdal POW Camp 160 was designed for 1,500 people, and among the prisoners of war there were people of different nationalities. Germans, but also Hungarians, Austrians, Croats, Serbs, Finns, and most of all Italians and Romanians. In her book Sizdal, 20th Century, A.I. Aksinova writes that according to the testimonies of old Sizdal residents, a huge column of prisoners of war entered the city, stretching along almost the entire main street. The local population poured out of their houses to see firsthand the hated invaders. They saw men wrapped in scraps of blankets and rags of various kinds, and their age was difficult to determine. Most of them were Italians, whom Mussolini had thrown to the front completely unequipped for the Russian climate. They evidently suffered especially from the cold. A lot of work on the history of the Suzdal camp, number 160, was also carried out by I. N. Fedotova. In her research, she writes that prisoners were transported by rail to Vladimir, and from there they were escorted to Suzdal on foot. The officers were placed in the cells of the Brotherhood building and in the former monastery prison, whereas several wooden barracks were built for the soldiers. The club, the office, and the punishment cell were located in the Archimandrite building. The Commandant's office and the sanitary unit were in the Nekolskaya church and the dining room was in the farm building. Immediately after the arrival of prisoners of war in the camp, an epidemic of typhus broke out, but the sanitary unit was not ready to fight this infectious disease. The camp authorities turned to other medical institutions for help, and soon 50 doctors and nurses arrived from the Ivanova region to Suzdal. But even after their arrival, the number of medical staff in the camp was not enough. Therefore, more than 350 patients were sent to other prisoner of war hospitals. Over time, the authorities managed to overcome the typhus epidemic and did everything to prevent this from happening again. By the summer of 1943, the situation in the camp was completely normal. 
It would seem that an evil fate brought captured Italians into the snowy expanses of Susdal, and they had to go through many ordeals. But as time wore on, many fell in love with this ancient Russian city. Many years after, the former prisoner Giacomo Dugini, who later became the mayor of his homeland town of Kles in northern Italy, came back to Susdal, knelt down and kissed the ground. When the top-ranking officers from the 6th Army arrived in the camp, the most comfortable conditions were created. Each of them was allocated a room with an orderly POW attached to him. But all the prisoners of war received food in accordance with the norms of the NKVD. If someone needed diet food, the camp leadership sought all the possibilities for this. It should also be noted that the representatives from among the prisoners could control both the amount of food dispensed and the quality of the food prepared. These were incredibly good conditions as compared to other camps and even to the Soviet population. The prisoners were allowed to wear their uniforms, insignia and distinctions. For the harsh conditions of the Russian winter they received a quilted jacket and caps with ear flaps. As POWs, the soldiers worked on the camp's maintenance. Officers could be given work, but only with their consent, so most of them preferred not to work. All the more so, since there was no provision for additional food for working. There were a few volunteers who worked in the farms and workshops. There was a library in the camp where the prisoners of war could receive not only books, but also newspapers and magazines. They were allowed to do gymnastics, play sports and other games, but not gambling. They could participate in amateur performances, singing, drama and music circles. Some of the officers tried their hand at painting and wood carving, and several exhibitions were organised with their work. Church services played a special role in the life of prisoners of war, and, meeting their many requests, the camp administration allowed a Catholic priest to conduct services in the Assumption Church. Therefore, to some extent, this environment resembled more a holiday home than a prison. The state of affairs caused many Soviet people not only bewilderment, but also bitterness, especially those who returned from the front or who had lost loved ones. The prisoners of war themselves were wary at first, but even then, when all doubts were dispelled, they continued to dislike everyone around them. As we'll see from Alexander Blank's memoirs, some of them believed that the Soviet government was trying to put their vigilance to rest so as to persuade them to treason. Despite the openly hostile attitude of the prisoners, the camp administration did its best to launch what is called the anti-fascist propaganda with political workers reading lectures in the club. The administration largely relied on the work of German communists. So, in June 1943, the chairman of the Communist Party, Wilhelm Peek, arrived in the Susdal camp. But among the prisoners, few supported anti-fascist slogans. For the most part, soldiers and officers believed that their business was to fight and execute orders of the command, and not to engage in politics. That is how Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus answered Wilhelm Peek on his cooperation offer. But over time, the administration nevertheless managed to achieve an ideological separation among the prisoners, and a branch of the anti-fascist Union of German officers appeared in the Susdal camp. Due to the presence of so many generals in the camp, German intelligence showed increased attention to the ancient city and, according to Blank, the Soviets neutralised more than one German agent trying to reach them. Because there was a possibility that the Germans would try to land troops in Susdal to free their generals, 30 senior officers, including Paulus, were sent to another camp located near Ivanova in early July 1943. Susdal Camp No. 160 was shut down in June 1946 as prisoners of war began to return home. Then the monastery housed a children's colony until the 1960s. The condition of the monuments in that time was dreadful. They were restored in 1968 when the monastery was completely transferred to the Susdal Museum. Now let's plunge deeper into the everyday routine of the camp through Alexander Blank's unique account. From a man faithful to Hitler's ideas to an open fighter against Nazism, such was the way of Friedrich Paulus. How did this evolution happen? 
Apart from the defeat at Stalingrad, what influenced him and how did the former 6th Army commander spend his time in captivity? The answers to these and other questions are provided by Alexander Blank, a young interpreter in the prisoner of war camp at Suzdal, who later became a famous Soviet historian, and by his student Boris Kavkin, who finished the professor's tremendous work, a very interesting document dated from the last days of the USSR and pure gold for today's history buffs. Stalingrad Battle Data has translated the most interesting excerpts as a basis for this unique video. Deep inside my field case, the only thing I have left since the wartime, I found some crumpled pages from a homemade notebook, fluent illegible abbreviated notes that have faded over time. There are lots of notes, and all in the same vein. These notes were work plans for the coming days and were clear to me alone. They were made in 1943 within the walls of the Efimev Monastery in the city of Suzdal. Here the POW camp, the Wehrmacht officers captured at Stalingrad were kept prisoner, including all of the generals. As a young officer I had to stay among them, but let's begin at the beginning. The order received by my unit in early January 1943 said, Urgently sent to Moscow at the disposal of the head of the main directorate of counterintelligence of the NKVD, USSR, all soldiers and officers with knowledge of the German language, higher education, positive military and political record, in order to carry out a special task. A few hours to gather and obtain documents, and then a few days to change trains, or rather, run from one to another, and then in the evening, stunned by the trip, I was standing on the Komsomol Square, veiled in darkness, where cars with blue headlights moved. Another half hour and I'm in the offices of the People's Commissar of Internal Affairs. Calling the telephone number indicated to me, I reported that I had arrived. Lieutenant Blank? asked a voice on the other end of the wire. Yes, yes, I confirm. Do you know Moscow? Of course I know. Then I will explain where you need to go. Opposite the Menasha Square, facing the Kremlin, there is a large corner building. On the second floor you will present your documents to the duty officer at the select hotel. Arrangements will be made for you for the night. Call again at 11am tomorrow. The next day, having received a pass ordered in advance in my name, I arrived at Building 2 of the USSR's NKVD. For an hour there was a conversation with a colonel, then a major. They were interested in the details of my then very short experience. Then they asked about my family. Then came a conversation about the knowledge of the German language. I studied it from childhood, I said to the colonel. Mother is a teacher of foreign languages. I read it freely. I know many verses, large chunks from Faust, Schiller, and I love Heine. But I have almost no conversational practice. He smiled. Never mind. You'll get that soon, and a lot. We'll call you again in the coming days. Four days later, I was given my instructions. You will go as a translator to the prisoner of war camp in Suzdal, 200 kilometers from Moscow, the colonel told me. The work will be responsible and interesting. You will receive travel documents, money, and your certificate. You need to leave immediately. By train to Vladimir and go to the department of the NKVD in that city. You will then be sent further on to Suzdal. They are already been informed of your arrival there, the colonel finished looking at me. I wish you success. Less than a day later I was in Suzdal. Any day now, there was expected the arrival of the main contingent, officers and generals of the German army, recently taken prisoner at Stalingrad. The captured Field Marshal and his generals were still at Krasnogorsk, a small town 20 kilometers northwest of Moscow. They arrived there three days after departure from Stalingrad, and for two months the six army generals got used to the rules of Soviet captivity. A good diet, medical care, warm living conditions and cleanliness. Suzdal, the once glorious capital of the oldest Russian province, had seen a lot in its thousand year history. The walls of its Kremlin, the wonderful buildings of numerous churches and monasteries were silent witnesses of great events. During the war years the city lived a modest working life. The impression was that life here flows at a distance from major roads and events. Sadly and leisurely, one can almost not feel war here. Soon the first party arrived, lieutenants, captains, majors. Then came the lieutenant colonels and colonels. The vast majority were from the 6th Army. We were preparing to receive a large group of generals led by Field Marshal Paulus. Talking with captured officers of different ranks and positions, we tried to form an opinion about the 6th Army. 
the main enemy force at Stalingrad. It soon became clear that legends about brave knights of the Sixth Army, about their aristocracy, valour and nobility, were still alive in the circles of prisoners. As if by tacit agreement, the prisoners of war avoided talking about serious topics in the first weeks in the camp. They discussed everyday topics, recalled previous events of their personal lives, relatives and friends in Germany. I noted that the prisoners were heterogeneous in official position and origin. Among the field and especially staff officers there were many proud sounding names, the sons and relatives of high ranking Nazi officials with the fond prefixes before their surnames. Almost everywhere, all prisoners of war without exception, even the most inveterate, unwittingly noted the exemplary order established from the first day in the Sizdal camp. Tidy living quarters, clean linen and most importantly food. The daily diet of a prisoner of war was bread 600 grams, sugar 17 grams, fats 15 grams, meat 80 grams, potatoes 900 grams, vegetables 400 grams, coffee 5 grams, tobacco 5 grams. Patients received additional rations including meat, milk and butter. Special nutrition was established for those affected by dystrophy. In short, the nutritional standards in the camp were significantly higher than those which the Wehrmacht troops fighting in Stalingrad were used to. As for the generals and senior officers, they lived quite contentedly. They received a variety of high quality food and even daily rations of Kazbek, cigarettes of the highest grade. It cannot be said that such conditions for the prisoners garnered much approval among the Soviet people working in the camp. We all heard and read a lot about the German Red Army POW camps. Everyone knew about the atrocities of the Nazis on Soviet soil. Many survived the front, the loss of family and friends, and therefore it was difficult and insulting to look at these well-equipped and clean camp dining rooms, comfortable living quarters, saunas, concert hall and library. But our attitude and education imperiously demanded it. All this is correct. And dining rooms, dormitories, quality food and caring doctors all this distinguishes us, the Soviet people, from the Nazis. All this puts us immeasurably higher than them. I remember our joyful excitement as we read the words of Leonid Leonov in Pravda. My people, even in their suffering, do not lose sight of what is right and do not lose their kindness. In Russian literature, it is hard to find words for cursing and anger against an enemy fighter captured in battle. We know what a prisoner of war is, we do not burn prisoners, we do not spoil them. However, what we learn from discussions among prisoners and specific replies of the most outspoken enemies, or, conversely, the most gullible officers, did not increase our sympathy for the temporary residence of the St. Euphemius Monastery. This is propaganda, some said, the most sophisticated Russian propaganda. They want to relax us to lull our vigilance, to expose the Fuhrer as a liar and a slanderer in order to induce us to betray our oath. The Russians are simply afraid of retaliation for mistreating us. They want to cover themselves in case of defeat, others said. Some even explained that there was nothing surprising in this phenomenon of forgiveness. The kind Slavs, they say, give in to the people of the superior race. They feel inferiority and pay tribute to the knights of the German spirit. The most intellectual referred to literature to explain Russian psychology. Dostoevsky has long explained the Russian soul. It is characterized by a complex of love-hate. And someone even remembered Tolstoy with his non-resistance to evil. We exchanged opinions about these judgments and were surprised at the complacency and stupidity, the arrogance and primitivism of our wards. Many unusual problems immediately confronted a Soviet man who got to work in a prison camp. Firstly, you should not forget for a minute that you were among enemies. Though no longer armed, but by no means friends or even neutrals. And nothing could change this feeling. Neither the courteous salutes and the purely German clicking of heels, nor the helpful willingness to carry out an order of the camp officers, nor the endless Jawohl. For several days, like a nightmare, I was tormented by the melody of a tune performed by one of them. Jawohl, meine Herren! So haben wir es gern? Jawohl, jawohl, jawohl. That's right, gentlemen. We love it very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some prisoners, 
had openly ingratiating facial expressions. But this did not deceive nor did it reduce the feeling of heightened alertness and our almost frontline vigilance. Secondly, there was another, no less acute feeling. It was dictated by the peculiarities of the worldview of the Russian man who, yet having no concrete facts and data, could not ignore that in this one-sided at first glance crowd of disarmed and outwardly completely obedient soldiers and officers, there were not only irreconcilable enemies, war criminals, but also Germans deceived by Hitler's promises and maybe opponents of his bloody regime. When hundreds of officers and soldiers stood frozen together when called to attention during the morning roll call, and the prisoner's spokesman, Romanian Colonel Cambrai, reported to the camp commandant, Colonel Novikov, I had the feeling that this momentarily still formation of enemy soldiers and officers was like a small-scale model of the entire Hitler Wehrmacht, and perhaps even the entire Reich with its large and small Führers, fanatical Nazis and militarists of the old Prussian order on one hand, and with workers, peasants and intellectuals called up from reserve on the other. And besides the genuine Nazis and their opponents, there were also those who simply sincerely rejoiced at this captivity as a pure deliverance from the nightmares and constant dangers of war. Together with the commander of the 6th Army, Field Marshal Paulus, the following were brought to Suzdal Camp. General von Zeidlitz, the former commander of 51st Army Corps, General Strecker of 11th Army Corps, General Schlommer of 14th Panzer Corps, and Generals Du Bois, Schmidt, Koffes, Lathman, Lenski and Roska, among other generals, and Colonel Adam. By that time, Italian, Romanian and Hungarian generals and officers were in the camp along with the Germans, sharing the fate of their allies defeated at Stalingrad. There were also Spaniards from the Blue Division. Almost all prisoners of war were very wary at first and repeated Goebbels' fabrications of the horrors of the Soviet captivity, something that could not but leave a trace in the minds of these men. Although they have been in the hands of the Soviet authorities for about three months now, in conditions which were not only rigorously compliant with international standards for the treatment of prisoners, but also created quite favourable conditions for them, their wariness did not pass. This feeling was relentlessly fueled by the active Nazis among the POWs, with more and more provocative rumours about some special events allegedly threatened by the Soviet authorities. The distrust and wariness of the prisoners had to be overcome. This task was solved by our political workers. Among them were many interesting, capable people. They possessed the knowledge of a historian, the resilience of a fighter and the talent of a propagandist. Working tirelessly, we young officers, watching the work of our senior comrades, felt sincere admiration for their skills. General Schmidt, former Chief of Staff, 6th Army, was the most active anti-Soviet figure in the camp. Other generals joined him in his task of maintaining the Nazi spirit. Strecker, Heitz, Oroska, De Boy, Leser, Schlommer, Dreber, Rodenberg, Magnus, Sicht von Arnhem, Zana, Rinaldi. The keynote of their conversations in the spring of 1943 was the forecasts of their release from captivity by German troops. Almost no one doubted that this would certainly happen. They only argued about the timing. Optimists predicted the summer, pessimists predicted autumn or winter. And, surprisingly, this idea of deliverance was not altogether fanciful. It seems like the Germans did undertake some actions to this end. There came warnings from Moscow that, according to the information received, German intelligence showed exceptional interest in the area of Suzdal and the nearby camp at Vojkova, which opened a few months later in the summer of 43. The approaches to both camps were under intense control by our counterintelligence. And then we learned about a German agent nicknamed Ustinov. Colonel Putzirev one of the leaders of the camp in Vojkovo writes in his memoirs. He was captured in Suzdal, where he had been working as a stoker in a bakery for two weeks. He was parachuted into this area with another man, but they did not manage to contact their leaders by radio and were unable to fulfill their mission. So the attempt by German intelligence to infiltrate Suzdal and Vojkovo failed. <laughs> 
Whatever personalities from among the captured generals and officers were there in 43, Marshal Paulus naturally attracted the greatest attention of the camp staff and the prisoners of war themselves. I had a chance to communicate with him daily and for a long time. My notebook was full of references like Conversation with P. 8443 Reading newspapers to the field marshal and so on. The soldiers and officers of the Nazi Wehrmacht felt guilty for crimes unprecedented in the history of mankind. Therefore, they expected retribution for their atrocities. Nazi propaganda, in turn, spared no pains to describe the horrors allegedly waiting German soldiers in captivity. Paulus and the other generals were also expecting some kind of punishment, which would settle accounts with them on the basis of an eye for an eye. But everything turned out differently. Paulus and his colleagues found that in Soviet captivity, other laws were in force. The rules of international agreements regarding prisoners of war were strictly implemented, and they were treated with all possible humanity. At first they did not believe that they would survive. Then they began to look more closely and draw conclusions. In the Susdal camp, Paulus followed a strict routine. Morning exercises, walks alone, several hours of work in a small orchard surrounding a two-story house where the generals lived, this house is now demolished, conversations with the generals and his adjutant Colonel Adam, who was the person closest to him. Paulus spent a lot of time reading. At his request, he was bought Marx's Das Kapital in German and French. For many hours he was engaged in translating Marx's brilliant work from French into German, and then checking the translation he had made with the German original, rejoicing when the text coincided, or when his translation came close to the original. But Das Kapital interested the field marshal not only as material for translation, he also studied it carefully. In April or early May, I remember, he also asked to get him the dialects of nature by Engels in German, and to indicate him the part of Lenin's works assessing Clausewitz. I remember well an evening conversation in his room in May. How strange, said Paulus, that I, the German, read the works of the great German writers Marx and Engels for the first time in Russian captivity. And after a pause he added, and maybe this has a precise, deep and symbolic meaning. Then he asked for a long time and in detail about how we study communist theory in higher educational institutions of our country, and if German philosophers and classics of literature entered our field of study. And of course they did. Unlike many of his colleagues, Paulus was a widely educated man. I remember how the field marshal surprised the prominent Soviet scientist A. Kochenstein who was then Deputy Chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. He met with Paulus while travelling in Suzdal. The Field Marshal expertly spoke of new methods of treating tuberculosis, the work of German physiologists, and the healing properties of the Swiss resort of Davos. Paulus' endurance and self-control could be envied. Here is just one example. Hitler was hiding from the German population that the Field Marshal and other generals at Stalingrad had surrendered. Their relatives and friends considered them dead, and for a long time had no news of them at all. Of course, the generals and officers who were in captivity also did not know anything about their loved ones. The letters, which, in accordance with the Convention on Prisoners of War, were sent to Germany through the International Red Cross, and were intercepted by the Nazi censorship, and were not delivered to their recipients. The Soviet command took the necessary measures to deliver to the wife of Marshal Paulus, E. Elena, Constance, a letter from her husband, and to receive an answer from her. One can imagine what difficulties Soviet intelligence officers working in the Reich needed to overcome in order to carry out such a complex task. One day the field marshal was invited to the camp commandant's office. In addition to Colonel Novikov, there were several Soviet officers and I the translator. We have a surprise for you, said one of the officers. Do you recognize the handwriting? he asked, handing the envelope to Paulus. The marshal put on his glasses, looked carefully at the envelope. His hands, usually calm and unhurried, began to tremble noticeably. But he restrained himself, did not open the envelope right there, but thanked the Soviet officer, put in his tunic's pocket, and continued to talk for several minutes. Having finished, he left the office and headed for his room. Only there did he read the letter.
After this, Paulus did not talk to anyone and walked alone until very late. But the next morning, he resumed his usual routine. Paulus was constantly pressured by the generals. They made every effort to ensure that the field marshal, senior in rank among prisoners of war, formally opposed the Soviet anti-fascist activities which they said was betrayal. One day in June 1943, General Heitz came to him. In a crude and tactless form he began to dictate to Paulus the points of his ultimatum, to declare traitors all officers who attended anti-fascist meetings in the camp. Heitz demanded that Paulus formally threaten all prisoners of war, that the generals would find channels for transmitting to the Reich information about anti-fascist prisoners of war, and then their families would suffer terrible punishment. He added that he was speaking not only on his own behalf, but also on behalf of a group of other generals, Rodenberg, Schmidt and Sicht von Arnhem. Paulus listened to him without interrupting. Then he said, You seem to have forgotten, General. You are no longer the chairman of the Imperial Military Tribunal, and not even the corps commander who shot his own soldiers. You are a prisoner of war here. Please remember this. After a short pause, he added, You're dismissed, General. Feel free to leave. That evening, the dinner, bought as always, by Paulus's orderly, remained untouched. Paulus sat alone until late, and even his closest friend, Colonel Adam, who came to visit him, immediately left the room. Since that time, the field marshal no longer spoke with the generals Heinz and Roddenberg. He only acknowledged their greetings. At the end of June 1943, Paulus had an intense conversation with Schmidt. Colonel Adam also took part in it. It dealt with one of the most pressing issues that worried the prisoners of war, officers and general. First, to whom was given the military oath upon entering the Wehrmacht? To the Führer or to the German people? And second, does the consciousness of pursuing a criminal policy towards the German people exempt one from the obligation to be faithful to the Führer? Paulus hesitated. In an undertone, as if arguing aloud, he said that in the current situation, loyalty to the Führer does not always mean loyalty to the people. Recent events, he added, make us think about the essence of the oath. Paulus recalled that in the first hours of his captivity, Soviet generals emphasized that they distinguished between the German people and the Hitlerite clique. This was probably the first political statement we heard from the Soviets in captivity, said Paulus. Schmidt could hardly restrain himself, and with all his arrogance he expressed anger and indignation. We are children, gentlemen, to trust this propaganda of the Reds. All this chatter about the people is no more than a bait for the gullible, but I hope there is no such one among us, the general said, looking inquiringly at his interlocutors. No, Schmidt, it's not as simple as you think, said Paulus. You're right, we are no longer children, and that is why all this should be thought over carefully. Paulus got up and walked around the room, making it clear that the conversation was over. We will come back to this subject later, said the field marshal, concluding the conversation. Schmidt and Adam said goodbye and left. Perhaps Paulus, as a seasoned officer formed back in pre-Hitler times, could not help but feel a sense of disgust toward threats of punishment. But of course, there could be no talk of any active protest by the field marshal against Hitler's policy. When there was talk about German atrocities, Paulus invariably remained silent. Once he was angrily asked by a Soviet official who had just visited the liberated region of Smolensk, Why do you validate such atrocities and crimes unheard of yet in any war? The field marshal went into a mute defence and answered dryly, I know nothing about this. The army does not deal with such matters. Such was Paulus, an ambiguous and contradictory individual. I remember another very remarkable conversation with the field marshal. He was talking about the Soviet people and the fact that they live in poverty and under constant fear and therefore have nothing to lose, as he put it. I said, It's not for you, field marshal, to speak of fear and lack of rights. Your Reich is a gigantic concentration camp where everyone is afraid of the other, where even for seditious thought people are thrown into a dungeon. 
You may know the name of Brecht. His book is in our camp's library, and there you can find the poem Horrors of the Regime. Read it before judging on fear and lack of rights. Paulus answered, I heard about Brecht, and I know that he writes bad plays and mediocre poems, and in general I don't read red poets, and I don't listen to red propaganda, Herr Leutnant. Or maybe you think that next time I will welcome you like this, he said sarcastically, throwing up his left fist in the greeting of the German Rotfront communists. We're not going to make you a communist, Field Marshal. Our views are directly opposed. It is unlikely that we will ever think alike. This is only a first glance, my interlocutor objected. If you look closely and think carefully, your orders are very similar to ours. We have the Führer, you have Comrade Stalin. And just like ours, the party and the secret police command the generals. Was it the Germans who destroyed your best generals, Tukhachevsky, Blucher, Yakia, Igorov? I found myself in a very difficult position. None of us, ordinary Soviet people, then knew the truth about Stalin, about the crimes of Yezhov, Beria and their henchmen. We NKVD officers working with prisoners of war did not know anything about the devilish cuisine of this department. The 20th Congress of the Soviet Union, where Stalin's crimes were denounced, was still 13 long and difficult years ahead. And what is known about Stalinism today, at the end of the 1980s, was simply unthinkable at that time. In 1943 I unconditionally believed in Stalin, so Paulus's comparison with Hitler was sacrilege to me. The concept of the USSR and Stalin were then inseparable. Of course, I did not know then about the true causes and extent of the Stalinist reprisals against enemies of the people, including military personnel. In a word, I did not believe Paulus. Your comparisons are insulting, I replied to the German Field Marshal. However, history will reward everyone according to their deserts.